He finally did it. For years, we were saying, if Rowan Marshall can just get a go at the number one ruck spot, he'll be a beast for us. Well, in 2023, that moved from hope field to certainty. But as we enter into a new year, the value, is it gone? Or is there still a little more to go? We're going to talk about Rowan Marshall on today's episode of the 50 Most Relevant. Joining me, a new person in the community, at least for the 50 Most Relevant. But chances are, if you've been on Twitter or X, you've seen this guy tweet over the past year or so. He's a recent team member to the gang, a Dr. Supercoach. In fact, we've got a second Dr. Supercoach member coming up in just a couple of days' time. And keeping up with the fantasy footy content creator, I don't use my real name. It's pig mentality. Hello, mate. How are you? Nice to meet you. Rowan Marshall, a fascinating guy to talk about. Hey, MJ. Nice to be here. And thanks very much for the invitation. I've listened to the podcast quite a bit. And it's great to be uh, on and chatting about Rowan. He's such a good player to look at. Let's dive into these numbers with a little bit more depth in Supercoach. He's coming in off an average of 114.3. It means in that format, he's priced at nearly $640,000. 15 tons last year, a top score of 160, a career high though of 173. So this Ruckman has got some serious ceiling about him and we'll get into more depth about that right throughout this episode. In AFL Fantasy and Dream Team, he's a million dollar plus player. Why? He's got an even better seasonal average of 115.8, 19 tons, a top score of 159 last year and 163. And pig mentality, so often when we look at and talk about players like Rowan, when we were talking about him last year, it was, it should happen. It should happen. All the variables are there. It should happen. And it's not always the case that this kind of hope-filled scoring does, but in every single way, Rowan, fulfilled his expectation and arguably went over and above what we'd hope he'd deliver for us last year from a fantasy and super coach perspective. Yeah, absolutely. I I started him and English and was quite well rewarded throughout the year, but even I didn't expect um, what Rowan was doing, ended up doing last year. And I'm a big Rowan Marshall fan. I love watching him play the way he goes about it. He takes marks, he kicks goals, he tackles hard. Um, but yeah, he just really took it to another level last year and, that was even with a few inconsistencies at the start of the year um, and just went bang after the bye, um, which I know you've got some stats on. Yeah, we, we all do. But like that season overall, like 115 in AFL Fantasy, 19 tons, 10 over 120. So that's your captaincy consideration right there. And just the one score under 80. So he's not burning you in AFL Fantasy with a 60 or a 70 that just really kills you with high frequency. He's always right up there in the mix. Um, from round nine onwards, his lowest score was 96 and he ranked third for averages and total points. It was only Tim English who you alluded to earlier pig mentality and Marcus Bontempelli that did any better in super coach a 114 average 15 tons 10 of them over 120 so a really nice conversion of 100 to captaincy consideration five over 140 so a fantastic ceiling ranks fifth in their super coach format for total points and 11th by averages but you mentioned that he got better as the season went on Walk us through that, that split of what he did post buy, and is there a, an, a guess or an assumption or a narrative statistically that you can see would give us confidence that this isn't just a nice end of the year, but a potential trend heading into 2024? Yeah, look, he absolutely did come home like a steam train. He uh, AFL Fantasy 108 before his buy, 123 average after his buy. Um, that's a 15 point per difference up, uh, upside just from. Half a year, that's amazing. Super coach, similar vein. He went from 110 before his buy to 121 average after his buy. A lot of big captaincy scores in there for both formats. Um, and I had a look at it kind of breaking down the individual stats. His his kicks were the same, but most of his other stats went slightly up. So his handballs went up one per game. His marks went up 1.5. His tackles went up. His hitouts went up by two. Uh, his disposal efficiency went up. That might have helped a little bit in super coach. His CBAs went up. He went, he was 83% post buy. He went up to 90% after his buy. Wow. Um, but we've got to kind of ask why did that happen? One of the things that happened is time on ground was 82% before his buy. 
uh, and that went up to 87% after his buy, which, you know, 5% difference actually does make a fair impact. Yeah. Um, and his points per minute as well. So while I was on the ground, his scoring was 1.1, went up to 1. one eight. So just a little bump, but when counted is he got more time on ground and he was more efficient with that time. Um, so I think we just got to kind of ask why, and and that's that's a hypothetical, I guess. We don't fully know why, but whether that was Ross Lyon's first season and he was feeling things out for his first half and then kind of let him lose, whether it was the Saints trying to stay in the in the um, finals race and they needed to rely on their guns a bit more, whatever it is, um, it could have even been you know this was Rowan's first season as a solo ruck, so maybe he needed nine, ten games to kind of warm up to that. Um, but what, whichever way you look at it, he was incredible post by, and I don't really see a reason why we can't expect that again this year. He was, you're right, absolutely incredible. And that last three games of the year, 134 in AFL Fantasy and Dream Team and 147 in Supercoach. So literally this trend, big mentality you're talking about, is as every moment of the year went on, he got better. And you look at this season, this 110 plus average across the formats and go, he must have had everything go his way. Well, no, he didn't. He got subbed out in the early fourth quarter against the Gold Coast Suns. The club weren't saying he was injured or anything like that. Rather, there was a clear picture that he was the most valuable player in this team. They were going to win this matchup against the Suns. So it was like, you know what? Just put him on ice a little bit if he's a little bit sore because we need him for the season. And then in round eight against North Melbourne, there was some real concern and, and fear, not just from us in the fantasy community that see a fly go past certain people and they're like, oh, don't touch him. That could, that could see him out. But he was questionable to play all week with an injury, so much so people were convinced he wouldn't make the flight to Adelaide. And even if he did, he's not even going to be there, that people were trading him out of their sides because they didn't want to cop the donut. Well, he played and he scored really well in that matchup too. He was so good through the year. And as you've mentioned, so much could go his way heading into 2024. And as we look back at yeah. 23, yeah, please. So, and another thing I was going to say on that is Rowan, I think people with that injury are prone. And at times he has shown some niggles and stuff, but he still averaged 19 games per season over his last five years. Um, so it's not like he's missed huge chunks of time and he still gets, you know, still gets through 19 games a year. If that's a 22 game season. He might miss three this year. We've obviously got more, but a couple of buyers. Look, I, I don't think I don't buy into the injury prone narrative as much as some do, I think. Yeah, for me, I think the fact is once you played the games that he did last year and you play that full season in that regard, I tend to take that injury-prone narrative out of the conversation. When it's year upon year upon year upon year and it never gets his body right, okay, I'll, I'll listen to you. But you deliver a year like that, sure, it's nice information in the back pocket, but the reality is he got us through last year. And I think until proven otherwise, we can have some confidence that he's finally understands his body. We know big, tall Ruckman do take time, not only to hit their ceiling, but also to just understand how to um, condition their body to be at their optimum when it comes to football. Uh, last year, Set and forget was the clear approach in the rucks. We were farting around a little bit with people going Grundy for a couple of weeks. It was Darcy Cameron for a little bit. Sean Darcy was in a bunch of different sides. But the reality is it was Marshall and English. And the longer you had both of them at R1 and R2, the greater your success profile probably was in 2023. But in 2024, it's a real different conversation. There is genuinely a combination of maybe like 12, 13 different variable patterns that you can go, this could work for me. You could go and start with a Tim English. I know there's some head and concussion concerns people have in the off season, but you genuinely ask the club and they go, if it was round one now, he's playing. We're just being conservative. So he's the top scoring player in AF last year, second in super coach. You could build an obvious case for him. Brody Grundy, he offers this pathway to major value and maybe incredible upside in this new team at Sydney. Max Gorn, 
dominant 120 plus seasons in Supercoach and 110 plus seasons in AF. It's been a while since he's been the sole ruck. He's finally back there. Tristan Cherry, while injured with that facial injury, still athletically and aerobically able to do all the off season conditioning with that facial injury. Everyone's expecting him to be back by at latest the preseason games um, that will count for us so we can have some confidence there. Kieran Briggs was like a reincarnated version of Shane Mumford. He went nearly 110 in Supercoach, high 90s in A, if you could build a case for him. Sean Darcy, we know he ruck shares a little bit, but on his day, he's a 140 guy across the formats. And then you've got Rowan, who again is a 110 plus guy from last year. Pigmentality, help us through navigating this ruck carousel of options because you could argue any single one of those two pairings feels like a valid starting squad option. Help us through it. How do we navigate these multiple options and, and helping us to know what's right for our teams? Well, yeah, like you said, there are a lot of options and I actually think that there's going to be a lot of right options. Um, I don't, I don't think you're going to, see a lot of teams making mistakes in the ruck line, especially if they stick to the English, Marshall, Gorn, Grundy, even Jerry. Um, I actually quite like all five of those picks um, for different reasons. Tim English with his scoring, obviously. Marshall with his scoring, both of them have no early buy. I really like the Gorn and Grundy combo, but them both having buys before round seven hurts their case. Um, and then Tristan Jerry first year um, as the sole ruck or he kind of doing Marshall and English of last year. I've got my doubts on Jerry's scoring ability compared to those guys because he doesn't accumulate the footy. And he's only averaged nine disposals for his whole career mm. um, per game kind of thing. Um, but the other four, I wouldn't talk anyone out of any of them. Um, and yeah, Rowan Marshall and Tim English, you've got to look at without the buy. Um, boost them. And one thing we can do is kind of look at the fixture um, that they've all got. Um, and in particular, one thing I found last year researching Ruckman a fair bit is that there are two really important things for Ruckman. Um, one's there is the opposition Ruckman they're coming up against is incredibly important. Like if you look at a midfielder, you're not kind of going, oh, Bont's coming up against Butters. So, you know, that's hard. You might a little bit. Um, but when you do look at Ruckman, you say, oh, Ron Marshall's coming against, up against, you know, Jeremy Finlayson. It does have a, re- that, that one-on-one all game, it has a real direct correlation. And then the other is venue. Um, it's big grounds like the MCG, less stoppages. Ruckman tend to score a lot worse. Little grounds like the SCG are just gold mines. Um, so they're generally the two things I look at when I look at um, Ruckman and especially their fixtures and their coming up. So I have gone into that a bit for the big five. Um, and so I, I'm just getting that up on my screen. So Tim English, Rowan Marshall, Max Gorn, Brody Grundy, Tristan Jerry. I looked at their first 11 rounds. And the reason mm-hmm. I chose 11 is that it, round 12 is when the next buys start. Yep. So I've just looked at those first um, 11 games. Max Gorn actually has the best run in terms of matchups if you exclude his buy in round six, which you can't. <laughs> if he was playing someone in round six, he would have the best buy. Let's put it that way. Yep. Uh, the best fixture. But if we kind of count the buy as a hard matchup because he's not playing and not scoring, then Rowan Marshall actually has the easiest run just ahead of Tim, Tim English. Brody Grundy actually has quite a difficult run um, in terms of Brody Grundy has to play Richmond and Hawthorne, which are quite hard, but then he also has to play Gold Coast and Frio. And last year, looking at the data, so the way I've done this, I look at the hit, the Ruckman hit-out win percentage. So that is looking at the total Ruck contest that each Ruckman attends and how often, what percentage do they win the hit-out. Um, and Wits and Darcy win it 50% of the time, which is a lot. Which that's the highest mark. For example, Marshall and English actually aren't as good as people think. They win at about 40% of every ruck contest. And the reason I think that particular stat's really important is because when you're a ruckman, say it's Tim English, that's from Marshall, whatever it is, your disposals per game, your marks per game, your tackles per game, I'm going to say they're generally fairly consistent no matter who you're playing on. Um, but it's your hit outs that, that kind of give you those spike scores. And I did find writing captain's articles and looking into captain's research last year 
whenever Team English or Rowan Marshall came up against what I'm calling an easy opponent, so last year it was a Port Adelaide or a West Coast or someone like that, their spike scores came because they won the hitouts and they got 40 hitouts in that game or something as opposed to 15 when they play wits. And that's especially important in Supercoach when hitouts to advantage are worth five points. Um, so you can see some huge spike scores when they do win the hit out and they get it to advantage. And I guess conversely, if you're Tim English and you're playing Jared Witts, you still might score 100 or 110 or 115 because you're getting around the ground and getting those other stats. But generally, you're not getting those 150s because you're not getting the hit outs or the hit outs to advantage. So that's kind of where I go with a lot of my ruck things. It, it, I look at um, what ruckmen they're coming up against that week. And it's not just a primary ruck. Usually teams use two rucks. So, for example, Melbourne, when Max Gorn's on the field, they're hard to score against. But when he takes a rest, it's Jacob Van Ruen, and he's very easy to score against. So I look at the two ruckmen, and, I, and I'm using this from 2023 data, which is flawed because players have moved clubs, players were injured. So in this model, it actually ranks Max uh, Melbourne as quite easy to score against. But that's simply because Max Gorn didn't play as many games and the volume's down, whereas Jacob Van Ruin's volume's up and it skews it. Mm-hmm. But it still gives a pretty good indication. So when I go through and look at it, um, Rowan Marshall in those first 11 rounds doesn't have to play Jared Witts. Wow. That's good. He does have to play Sean Darcy. Um, he does have to play Richmond or Hard, but he did have a 140 something, 146 on them last year with Nank playing. Um, and then he gets quite a few easy games. So he gets GWS and Bulldogs, who are quite easy. Uh, Port Adelaide, who are very easy. I wouldn't mind talking about Port Adelaide just for a second because I think mm. they're going to be the absolute guinea pigs for Ruckman this year. Mm. If, if your Ruckman's coming up against Port Adelaide, I'd be chucking the C straight on them. Even though Soldo can hold his own a bit. Yep. Um, and we're expecting Soldo to be the solo ruck. If Jordan Sweet gets a solo ruck, it might be different, but we don't have any 2023 20, data for him. We have 22 data, but I don't know how accurate that will be now. Players evolve. Um, so, yeah, there's a few matchups you would like to avoid. Frio, Gold Coast, also to a lesser extent, Richmond, Adelaide, Hawthorne. Um, and there's some you really want to go for, like Port Adelaide, Actually, even if your Ruckman's playing against the Kilda or GWS or Bulldogs, that's still good matchups. Mm. I've recommended people last year, for example, um, Captain Wits when he played English because English doesn't win the hitouts as much as people think he does. Mm. And Wits had a really big score against English. So the way I look at it, Max Gorn has a great first 11 rounds apart from the fact he doesn't play around six. So you've got to take that into consideration. I think he's still a really good starting option. Um, if you don't want to go around by players, Rowan Marshall and Tim English have quite good fixtures to start. Um, and the thing with Rowan, I guess, in the first 10 rounds, he's got a, a lot of good matchups in terms of the Ruckman he's coming up against. Hmm. But he plays at some weird venues <laughs> yeah. in his first 10 rounds. Um, so he goes to GMHBA, he goes to Norwood, he goes to Monica, he goes to Optus and Utahs. None of those games, none of those venues, apart from Optus, he's played more than four games at for his career. So yeah, there's very low data points. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, they could be good. I, Monica could be good for him. Norwood could be good with its small ground, but we don't actually know. We don't have that data. Hmm. Um, so if you want to back him in based on his matchups, I think it's absolutely fine to do. Um but if you're scared off because of the venues and he's not playing at Marvel much, I could see that as well. I'm, I'm probably not here to tell you which two rucks to pick, but I'm, I'm actually going to say any of those five I think could be, could be good. One of the reasons why I really wanted to have you on this episode specifically as we, we talk about Rowan Marshall is certainly over the past 12 months, the, the data work you've been doing for the community has been fantastic and how you've shared that. But Rux is really this area of dug down deep. And, and with Rowan, who's a perfect guy to look at because in the community, it's th- this popular narrative is I've got to get Grundy because he's value. Now we haven't seen him yet in the 50 most relevant, but there's a fairly high chance we'll see him. Tim English, top three scorer across the formats last year. How, 
Got to get him. Cherry, you've alluded to some concern about the disposals, but there's that opportunity now for him and Gorn. History says when he's the number one ruck, he could be the number one scorer in the game. So the reason I wanted you on this episode was to help us understand these nuances around Marshall, because there is a pathway where even though he might not offer as much upside as we like, where he might not be the number one scorer in this line, this combination of incredible consistency of scoring, beautiful matchup that runs through the buy. And in a moment, I want to get your thoughts, what it looks like post buy in a moment. I'm keen to get your thoughts on, on that as coaches consider upgrade season, especially if they're going a cherry or a Grundy at R2 and, and needing a pathway off them. But that was a beautiful analysis for us. So understanding the things we need to look at. There is some concern in the community that Jack Hayes coming in and playing the relief ruck role will hurt Rowan Marshall. Statistically, it was just one game last year. It was really good for Rowan Marshall and his scoring politely. Jack Hayes is a nice, really good lead up tall forward and a helpful relief Ruckman. What Rowan is excellent at is competing around the grounds, using his height and his versatility to add another body through the midfield. You mentioned that hit out rate. It's not as high as everybody mentions. He's still good. He's still competitive. He'll still get plenty of hit outs for you, but he's not that elite tap Ruckman that scares you off when you're coming up head to head. So for me, Jack Hayes, to me, he's just a little bit of salt and pepper that comes to a Rowan Marshall. To me, I have zero concerns about Hayes coming back into that side. But if you don't start Marshall, and maybe you do because you want to get avoid those early buys that a Grundy and a Gorn have for us, you're a little concerned by the English head knock that's been floated around through the preseason, and you look to upgrade then instead of start, what does it look like post buy for St Kilda and for the matchups for Rowan Marshall? Well, yeah, Rowan Marshall post buy St Kilda in general, their fixture is amazing. Um, so they, so Rowan Marshall plays eight out of his last nine, nine games at Marvel Stadium, which I, I don't know what that fixture is about, but that's incredible that's for St Kilda. There have been some stats floating around on Twitter about how um, the difference between, you know, for Jack Sinclair, Nasiah and Rowan about their difference scoring at, at Marvel versus other venues. And most of them were elevated at Marvel. Uh, and Rowan's, yeah, Rowan's absolutely in that camp. So I, I had a look in the stadiums that he's played at least five games at. So that's excluding like low data points like Marnica and Blunston. And he played a game at Riverway Stadium, wherever that is. Um so at least five games, he averages the most at the SCG. And that's no surprise. That's a really small ground. When I was doing a lot of the captain's research last year, I would be targeting Ruckman that went to the SCG. Um, so just on a, on a little side note, that mm. does spell good things for Brody Grundy if he's playing there a lot this year. Definitely. Um, but apart from the SCG, so Rowan Marshall's next two best scoring games are Adelaide Oval and Marvel. And he plays eight of his last nine games at Marvel. And the other one is at Adelaide Oval. It's pretty handy. So he plays his last nine games at his favourite, two of his three favourite grounds. Um, and yeah, his, 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 up, his averages last year at Marvel were up compared to everywhere else. Looking at Marshall's, um, when you go on Supercoach and you can look at kind of what they've scored at each venue, Marshall and Tim English is actually quite difficult because they've only just become solo rucks. So there's a lot of data points for when they were the number two rucks. So you might look at it and say, oh, you know, GMHBA has played four games. He only averages 85. I'm never going to – he's going to do that again. But I, I, I didn't look at him, but probably all of those games with Paddy Ryder in the side, who knows. Um, I'm just, just flagging that um, a lot of the data for these two Ruckman in, in particular isn't what they do now. Yeah. So their 2023 data is their most reliable, but they – we've only got 23 data points for that. So then after his buy – um, yeah, like I said, Rowan plays at grounds he loves in every single game. He gets a lot of what I'm calling medium hardness teams. So that's teams like West Coast, Brisbane, Sydney, Essendon, Geelong, Carlton. They're not easy. They're not hard. They kind of win the, the hit out about the same he does, the same rate that he does. So it's kind of um, neither here nor there with the hit outs, but just that 
the grounds that he favours, I think, really play into his favour. Round 16, in particular, he goes to Adelaide over and he plays Port Adelaide in what could be oh. a bloodbath. <laughs> if I have him, I'll be captaining him, let's say that. Um, it'll be the easiest scoring team for Ruckman and his one of his favourite grounds, so that could be big. And that's straight off his buy. So if you've had a Jerry or a Grundy, for example, that have made you a lot of money, but you're probably still giving up 10, 15 points a game to Marshall and English and Gorn, and you want to hop, round 16, I'd absolutely be looking at it. It could be a very rewarding first first welcoming to Rowan Marshall party. <laughs> he does have Adelaide and Richmond um, on the run home, which generally Riley O'Brien and Toby Nankervis can be a little bit limiting. Um, although, having said that, he did have, you know, 146 on Nank last year, and I think he had a big one, in a reasonable one in there again. Yes, 131 um, in AF as well, yes. Yeah. yeah. So he is one of those guys that defies a hit-out trend a little bit because he does get so many tackles and marks, so he can boost his score in other ways. Um, he's also the only player in these five Ruckman, these five popular Ruckman, that only has to play... Darcy once and Wits once in the entire season, whereas everyone else, so English, Gorn, Grundy and Jerry, have to play either Darcy twice or Wits twice. So that's like about three or four games against these real dominant guys. Marshall only has to play them each once, um, mm-hmm. and they're both before his buy. So he, do- he doesn't have to play either of them after his buy. So I think the more I'm talking about it, the more I'm looking at, geez, he's got nine games at venues he absolutely loves. He doesn't have wits. He doesn't have Darcy. He's got a lot of medium teams and plus the Port Adelaide booster potential in round 16. Yeah, I think he could be a perfect trade target if you're not happy with your R2 at that stage. Yeah. If you've so, if you've got people averaging around the same as him, you know, it might not be worth a sideways trade. If you've... Sure. It, let's say Gorn or Grundy are going at the same level, I wouldn't be doing it. But if you're disappointed with your R2, I, I'd be considering it. The, as Pig Mentality has done a beautiful job on this episode, giving us the pathway of if you're not happy with what those early rucks give you with some weeks off, depending on matchups, Marshall could get you through. It's not as favorable a matchup as it could be for others, but it's still reasonable. He helps you at the back end of the year at very least. Are you starting him or are you upgrading him? What's your thoughts, Pig Mentality? I'm thinking in fantasy and Supergo, just probably a little bit different just to the because of the pricing. Uh, in fantasy, he's about the same price as English. Um, and just giving their scoring last year I'd, and upside, I'd probably take English. And then Gorn's a fair drop-in price. So I couldn't really see a reason why you'd necessarily start, you know, start rowing in fantasy if you've got English or Gorn or Grundy. Supergo is a bit different because there's nearly... 80k different from English down to Marshall mm. and you know there, there was a fair average difference but also you know English has got quite a he's got a few red teams in his pre-buy um, and maintaining English is nearly 130 average that could be a tough ass so if you wanted to save a bit of money you wanted one of the big dogs but you wanted to save a bit of money in super coach you could get Rowan Marshall for 639k who doesn't have a buy I can't see any reason why he doesn't average what he did last year. Maybe even does what he did in the second half of last year and goes closer to 120. Um, or you could go down again to get Gorn. There's there's only kind of 50k difference between Gorn and Inge- uh, Gorn and Rowan Marshall, sorry. So it's not a huge saving, and you for Gorn you have that buy. Mm. So actually, for me right now, English is uh, no sorry. Rowan Marshall is in my team over Max Gorn. But I'm really I'm in an ring between the two, and I'm not sure where I'll land. It might even depend on Max Gorn's round zero score and whether he's going to spike or just plateau. Um, but yeah, I'm I'm a big fan of Rowan Marshall, and if anyone's even thinking about him, I would not persuade them against it. I think it's a great pick, and his second half of the year, if you're looking for an upgrade or if you want to get on it, eight games at Marvel, he loves against a lot of favourable or medium opposition and then one game in Adelaide over, which he loves against Port Adelaide. So it's there's a lot of upside good. on the run home. 
It absolutely is. So if it's not a starting squad, gosh, Pig Mentality is giving us this nice pathway and timeline to jump onto him and politely a bunch of other Saints too to really consider after that buy. Before we wrap up the episode, let's look at where he goes on draft day. He's an R1 without any question. The question is, how early does he go? Does he slide into the second round in your ideas or is he a first round pick across the formats every day? Yeah, 100% first round pick. I would not be letting him slide. I think Tim English will go ahead of him and rightly so, but then he could easily be number two or I could I could see why people would be wanting Nick Dacos as well at number two. Maybe they yep. want a big captain mid, but you know, top five, I would be taking him. Yeah, if, if you don't have a pick inside the first five to six selections on draft day, you're very lucky if you get access to Rowan, um, is politely yeah. how I'd say it. I, I agree. He's I can see a pathway where he stays on this scoring trajectory that he's on. The question is, what do the other rucks do around that? But these top four rucks that you've alluded to that are very popular in a draft and salary cap in Gorn, Grundy, English and Marshall, there's a very popular and understanding narrative that these guys go inside the first 10 selections on draft day. And I totally understand why. Pig mentality, it's been an absolute ripper to have you deep dive so brilliantly for us in the data trends uh, through uh, understanding rucks. If you haven't had a chance to connect with you, uh, where can we find you on social media? And also you're a part of the team at Dr. Supercoach. Uh, they do some fantastic stuff. Love those guys. Uh, where can they uh, listen to some of their great audio and video content that's dropping soon? Yeah, thanks for that, MJ. So as you mentioned, I've joined the Dr. Supercoach team this year uh, as their new podcaster. You can find me on Twitter at pig underscore DRSC. Uh, there's also um, JB at underscore DRSC. Pistol underscore DRSC, Chizo underscore DRSC are the other lads. Um, and then the the page Twitter handle is Dr. underscore SC for if you just want to follow Dr. Supercoach. And then what we're putting out this year, there's a bunch of stuff. Uh, there's weekly podcasts recapping the round. So that'll be Spotify, uh, Google Podcasts, wherever you get your podcasts. There's a YouTube channel for Dr. Supercoach, which we'll be posting a lot more videos of this year. Um, which including I'll be doing a weekly captain video recommending captains and I'm sure I'll be featuring some of these Ruckman quite heavily. Um, JB as well will have quite a bit coming out on YouTube. So go find Dr. Supercoach on YouTube. And finally, there is a Patreon if you're looking to get further involved in the community, um, gives us access to extra content or um, a Slack platform where we all chat. Dr. Supercoach Patreon. They're all options, whichever one you feel like, we'll be there. Do them all. That's the answer. If you love what the guys at Dr. Supercoach do, they've been absolute stars in the community for a really long time. And if you play Supercoach, you know about them. If you're just new to Supercoach, this is one of the content creators you don't want to sleep on and get involved in and worth every single cent uh, to invest in that Patreon. If you love a content creator in the fantasy space and there's pathways to get involved to financially support them, chipping in or whether it be that Patreon or whatever, the buy me a coffee or whatever links and opportunities you can do to financially support them, it really does make a significant difference. So um, if you want to jump on over and do that for them, we'd absolutely encourage you to do so. Mate, it's a pleasure to chat about Rome with you and look forward to seeing and hearing more from you in the super coach and afl fantasy community this off season and pre-season and then full season proper absolutely it's been a pleasure to jump in jump on mj talk about rowan talk about one of my favorite players and have a good chat with you absolutely Cheers. Not pleasure, my friend. If you missed any of those links that uh, he just shared with you about where you can get in touch with him or all of that Dr. Supercoach content, we've put it in the description of this episode. Just click on through and we've then linked it all up for you. So you'll be able to find all that super duper easy. If you haven't checked out the article on Rowan or all of the other players so far of the 50 most relevant, you can check that out at coachespanel.tv. And if you are loving these audio podcasts, well, they're wherever you find your podcast from, make sure you've subscribed subscribed, followed us along, given a five-star rating. And if you leave a review on Apple Podcasts, of course, if it's positive, we're more likely to read it out. But if you leave a little review there, we'll give you a shout out and thank you for taking that extra 20 seconds out of your day and being able to let us know. If you want to get in touch with social media with us or join our Patreon supporter group, all the details for that are in the description of this episode. 
Oh, it's getting pretty serious to the 50 most relevant. We're getting to the final portion of the teens, and there's just a couple of players left to go. Tomorrow, who's coming up? Here's a quick clue. For the first time ever, he averaged 100 plus. It's the first time he's done it in his career. It's pretty high for a guy in the 50 most relevant that's only got one season where he's gone 100 plus. But this trajectory of this player over the past 50 games of football gives me supreme confidence that across the formats, he is just about every single week a vice captaincy and a captaincy option. In at least one of the formats, I've got him locked away as a top eight midfielder and banging the door down in the other. And there's a few little things that have just happened to fall his way that make him and his team incredibly relevant for us. Who is he? You'll find out tomorrow in the 50 Most Relevant.